And now to today's speaker, Professor Ori Pritz, who most of you know. Uh, 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 Ori, uh, and I'll call her Ori because I don't ever call her Professor Kritz. I, I Nobody imagine. does. Nobody does. <laughs> uh, 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 Ori received her PhD and her uh, uh, master's in uh, philology or philosophy in Yiddish from Columbia University. Uh, master's in Hebrew Literature and a BA in Hebrew Literature and Philosophy from Tel Aviv University. Professor Kritz, Ori, uh, 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 and not only has uh, taught uh, the most Hebrew classes uh, in her time here at OU, she's also been uh, sometimes officially, sometimes unofficially, the head of the Hebrew uh, program here at OU. Uh, I might add that she writes and publishes and teaches in two languages, Hebrew and Yiddish, and maybe one day we'll even have some Yiddish literature in translation taught here at OU. Certainly there's no shortage of great modern Yiddish classics. Do you? Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, excuse me, she also writes and publishes in English. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten there, David. Uh, it's weird to be corrected twice in one interruption. <laughs> but okay. Uh, <laughs> Ori's publications <laughs> include uh, In the Paths of Poetry, uh, on Hebrew Poetry, a two volume edition, Poetics of Anarchy. Uh, written in English uh, <laughs> and published by Peter Lang in 1997, Sipore HaKibbutz, that isn't English, uh, Kibbutz Stories, three volumes, co-ed, authored with uh, uh, her father, also a very fine scholar, uh, uh, Ruven Kritz. Uh, she's written ten uh, or more articles, this is probably a little old, on a variety of subjects in Hebrew and Yiddish, some in English, some in Hebrew, uh, maybe there's another language I'm missing, German. and uh, German, uh, and uh, that Ori has been able to be a productive uh, scholar while her appointment is in fact entirely uh, based on her uh, teaching of many, many, many sections of Hebrew at many, many levels is really a tribute to her industry and to her commitment, frankly, to the Hebrew language, to the Yiddish language and its study. And I just want to uh, say uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure uh, to uh, have her, and as we had Yael in the fall, talk a little bit about their scholarship as opposed to um, Deek Duke, as opposed <laughs> to talking about uh, grammar, which is what they spend most of the time uh, knocking into uh, you uh, one way or another. <laughs> so, without further ado, Professor Ori Kretz. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And um, I'd like to remark two, two remarks before I start. One, all those of you, especially students who have to leave to go to classes, I don't mind if you just walk out in the middle of the lecture. My ego can stand it. <laughs> and um, another remark is that I heard from various places that poetry is not very appealing. So, in this lecture, I will not mention poetry at all. <laughs> yeah. um, except for the fact that she was a wonderful poet, okay? And I will bring my examples from prose and from her diaries, so you can relax. <laughs> okay, so um, Leah Goldberg is one of the most important poets in Israel. However, she wrote novels, plays, children's literature. She translated from various languages. She was a very prolific and important theater critic. 
and, and also an editor of various uh, literary magazines and journals throughout her life. However, as important is her contribution to academia. Goldberg created the first comparative literature department in Israel at the Hebrew U in uh, 1952, which she chaired for about 10 years. Her research was on 19th century Russian literature, theory of literature, and comparative literary issues as well. During her lifetime, she received various prizes for her writing. The most important one, the Israel Prize for Creative Writing, was received by her mother after her death in 1970. She died of cancer at age 58. She was born in Kovnas, Kovna, um, which is in Lithuania in 1911. Um, to Avraham, an economist who served as a supervisor for an insurance company called Russia, and to Tsipa, later changed her name to Tsila. She was an only child, and the language spoken at home was Russian. When the First World War broke out, three-year-old Goldberg had to escape with her parents to the Russian Empire. In Russia, um, her mother gave birth to a baby boy that died after a few months. Um, his name was Emmanuel. Um, when the family traveled back to Konas in 1919, a Lithuanian border patrol from the White Army stopped them and accused her father of being a Bolshevik spy. Bolshevik, any explanation? No, okay. Um, so they locked him up and for about a, a week, they would take him out, they locked him up in, in abandoned stables, they would take him out, um, prepare his execution, and then not shoot him at the last minute. Every day, it's the same thing was repeated. Finally, he was released, and the family was able to continue the journey home. However, he was in a serious mental state, and eventually lost his ability to function normally. Goldberg's mother divorced him, and he left um, Konas to receive treatment and lived elsewhere. <coughs> it is unknown what was his fate. He probably died during the Holocaust. Um, both Leah and her mother refused to give testimony for Yad Vashem. This is the Holocaust Museum and Archives in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, they refused to give any information about him or anybody else in the family. Um, however, from her diaries, she kept diaries since she was about 10, 11 years old. Um, she writes about letters she was, uh, that she received from him. She was very, very happy to receive. And um, she really looked forward to hearing from him. She graduated from a Jewish school, and uh, she studied a little bit in, in uh, Kaunas University, where she studied German and Russian literature and Semitics. She left home to study in Berlin. She didn't finish school there either. She received a PhD at age 22 from Bonn University. Her thesis was on the Samaritan translation of the Bible. In 1935, she settled in Tel Aviv, um, and she was already pretty well known by then. She was celebrated, and her first book of poetry was published at the time also. 
She later moved to Jerusalem when she received her position at the Hebrew University. Several years before her death, Goldberg returned to her childhood passion, painting. At the same time, she wrote almost no poetry, and also she also illustrated several of her books. She said, writers are drawn to paint because they search for the real existence, because its perception is direct. Probably this is why I escaped to painting, because I hardly write. During the last year of her life, she had two exhibitions of her artwork in two important places in Israel. She never married, she did not have any children, and lived with her mother from 1936 until she died. Her mother outlived her 11 years. Goldberg's work is still taught at all levels, from kindergarten to PhDs, and her work is loved, and I just want to say to those students who are disappointed that we're not talking about poetry, Yael is teaching her poetry in Hebrew, and I'm willing to do that too, um, if you would like me to. So, a lot has been written about her poetry and her life, her relationships with her mother, her unsuccessful and at times scandalous relationships with men, as you know, is one of her secrets. <laughs> um, she was criticized for her fat legs, unattractiveness, and her depressions. The claim was that she was looking for a father figure because of the trauma, her father's, uh, of the trauma of her father's mental illness. As for her mother. The assertion was that her mother sacrificed her life to take care of her daughter, claiming she would not have been able to function on her own. Her mother is even quoted as saying at Leah's funeral, luckily, she went before I did. Had I died first, Leah could not have been able to survive even one day. Shocking. Lately, in the past decade or so, critics started a more serious and broader interest in Goldberg's career as a professor of comparative literature and her writing as a whole. A documentary was made about her. A conference was dedicated to her on the 100th anniversary of her birth. The National Library in Jerusalem created a special website dedicated to her, her work, documents, things that were written about her, everything that has to do with her. And in 1911, it was decided to have her picture on the new 100 shekel bill, replacing Yitzhak ben Tzvi, the second Israeli president. My contribution to the research done about Goldberg and her work is looking at her biography and writings through the perspective of Shea. I will illustrate it by talking about Goldberg's most celebrated novel, The Wu Ha'o, and this is the light, published at age 26. <coughs> the plot of the novel spreads over summer of 1931. The protagonist, Nora Krieger, a 20-year-old student, returns home to Konas for her summer vacation after finishing her first year in archaeology at the University of Berlin. In the center of the novel is her relationship with Albert Ehring, a friend of her father's. Nora falls in love with him when he returns to Konas that summer for a visit after an absence of 25 years. There are parallels between him and her father. I'm talking about Nora now, not about Goldberg. Um, they both are the same age and both suffer from mental illness. But while she longs after Erin, she tries to avoid her father 
who also returns home for a few days from mental institution until he is able to find a place to live, because as you remember, her mother divorced him. At the end of the novel, it is the eve of Nora's return to Berlin. She imagines a conversation with Erin, who by now disappeared, nowhere to be found. She tells him that she is happy to return to Berlin because you all surrounded me with abyss from all sides. I can't take it. He tells her, you will be there and your past will be there and your childhood and your father and me. Nora decides that enough is enough. If she contemplated suicide in the past, she will no longer do so. She tells him, I want to live all the many days ahead of me, even one of them, every one of them, <coughs> sorry, to the end. She no longer wants to hold on to the fear of mental illness that haunted her all her life, which also haunted Goldberg. She decides, in spite of you all, I will not lose my mind. I will be sane. I will be strong, and I will be very happy. And she tells him, I can live without a childhood. I can skip it. One can even skip oneself, one's soul, one's being, one's dead people. At the end of the summer and of her visit, she reaches a certain awareness and changes her attitude towards her past and its influence on her. The novel is Nora's attempt to decipher herself and reach inner tranquility. In other words, she feels she saw the light. This is the motif that runs through the novel and it's also in the title of it. A lot has been written about the autobiographical aspects of the novel and the similarities between Lea Goldberg and Nora. Uh, both born in 1911, both returned home at the summer after a year in Berlin, um, and both had similar issues. The critics' uh, discussion usually centers around the trauma both Goldberg and Nora experienced due to their father's mental illness. The typical claim is that this trauma is what shaped both Goldberg's and Nora's life especially when it came to their choice of love objects. They both fell in love with men who are either uninterested or unable to commit to a long-term intimate relationships because they were trying to substitute their relationships with their fathers. Undoubtedly, their father illnesses greatly impact their lives. And while this conclusion could be true for Nora, that's how the novel ends. It's not accurate for Goldberg. In addition, there are hints in the novel that is not true for Nora either. This is my thing. Okay? I think the complexity roots are in much earlier traumatic childhood experiences, which is the key to understanding both Nora and Goldberg and Goldberg's writings. One of the sources for this conclusion is a nightmare Nora has without any changes for the fourth time since she was four years old. In the nightmare, Antonina, the maid, goes out to the woodshed to bring wood for heating the house. Among the logs of wood, the four-year-old Nora, that's when she dreamt it the first time, sees a Russian beggar. She's short and is both armless <coughs> and legless. The horrified Nora yells to the maid and begs her <clears throat> to leave the beggar and not put her in the oven with the logs of wood. Can't you see? This is the woman that sits in a small cart on the street corner she begs for donations for the sake of Jesus the Messiah. The beggar does not utter a word, just 
shakes slowly her shrunken head, and her back and narrow mouth stretches to a mute smile of agreement, and she evokes pity to the point of tears. Antonina does not listen to Nora. She ignores her cry and continues to place the logs, including the beggar, in the oven and lights everything. At this point of the dream, Nora always wakes up, her heart cold from absurd and everlasting fear, and feels that her legs are separated from her body as if she's completely paralyzed. The fact that the nightmare re recurs, and recurs exactly the same way each time, and now I'm being Freudian, because the dream is Freudian and Goldberg was Freudian, um, suggests that Nora is unable to truly understand it and resolve the trauma it represents. The nightmare is very Freudian, as I said, like the other dreams, there are other dreams in the novel. However, there are subconscious aspects to this nightmare. It is clear that little Nora identifies with the beggar. The beggar's arms and legs are amputated, which points out to the helplessness of Nora. The beggar is silent and does not try to oppose her being thrown into the oven to be burned. It points out again to the inability to resist or create conflict, even though it is a situation of life or death. Toward the end of the novel, the reader receives tools to decipher the nightmare, according to Goldberg. In the reality of the novel, Telka, the maid of Nora and, and um, Esther, brings a bottle of wood of wood logs to heating. The remi the, that reminds Nora of the nightmare, and she thinks, I'm losing my mind. Today, I will lose my mind. And why not? It is the same whether it happens now or later. The legless little woman was folded in the bundle of wood. It's the same. Nora sees herself as a sacrifice brought forcefully to the altar. She connects the nightmare to the madness, to her father and to Arne, and thinks, why am I thinking about it? It is the same, it is the same. They are trampling my life, trampling, trampling my life, all of them. All of them is not explained. And it is possible she refers to the rest of the family, to all of them. <coughs> it should be noted that at age four, Nora's father was well-to-do, respected architect. The mental illness started a few, years a few years later. The nightmare clarifies that the trauma was created before him. That is, Nora's blaming the hereditary mental illness as the source of her problems and the similar claim among critics are not accurate. Concentrating on the hereditary familial mental illness diverses the discussion from the real source of the problem. Therefore, the narrator's words after Nora wakes up are not convincing. The narrator says, mm -hmm. afterwards, the thoughts went and became a bit clearer, and with them arose the amazement over the strange answer of the nightmare. The narrator lacks the awareness because Goldberg was unaware. The source of the problem and the trauma is not the father, but rather the shame from which both Nora and Goldberg suffered since early childhood. Shame is an effect that functions to amplify awareness, moderate intensity, and protect one's humanity. 
is it seen in a positive mechanism in controlling behavior and offering mm -hmm. social boundaries. However, shame can be destructive when the whole self is evaluated by destructive, internalized, subjective standards. This shame is connected to feelings of self-criticism, self-rejection, and the conviction that the person deserves to be rejected by others. Since the nightmare represents an early childhood trauma, it is possible that the source for Nora's shame is her relationship with her mother. Starting early on, Nora feels the nightmare is based on a real experience but can't pinpoint a specific <coughs> event. You can walk in, look for a place to sit, feel comfortable. Experience, but she can't pinpoint the, the event itself. And um, she says, the narrator says, immediately as she woke up, it seemed to her still, as in those days of childhood, that it is not all a nightmare, that rather um, it is rather a memory. And this whole incident was in reality a long time ago and it is impossible to recall them. Shame that comes from parents to children is called hereditary shame. It is created already in babies. The trauma is not a specific event, but rather recurrent instances of shaming. While each occurrence is not traumatic by itself, it becomes traumatic when it's repetitive, and therefore she can't pinpoint a specific event. Shaming happens by an unexpected exposure of vulnerable aspects of the self before the child has developed ego boundaries to protect itself. This is an experience of emotional abandonment. It occurs when parents do not provide emotional conditions necessary for a healthy development. If it recurs, the child is more likely to develop shame that will take over his, ident his identity. Each time the child is shamed by being abandoned, certain emotions are provoked, such as anger, pain, sadness. Since all emotions of shame parents are based on shame, they are unable to tolerate their children's emotions. Therefore, they shame the children by ignoring or minimizing their magnitude. For example, as you say the you know, Polish mothers, um, you don't have a reason to cry. <laughs> and if you don't stop crying, I'll yes. give you a, a real reason. <laughs> <laughs> the child develops defense mechanisms, such as denial, projection, rationalization, and repression. These defense mechanisms protect the ego from the pain of shame. Child is forbidden to have needs. Needs of others seem to be more important. In order to feel accepted or in order to avoid rejection, the child learns that it is not tolerable to show emotions because he understands that his feelings are not true or not important. Thus, the child unemphasizes his feelings in order to minimize the pain. It is possible to assert, to assert that Esther Krieger, Nora's mother, is a shame character. She has characteristics and behaviors that can be connected to shame. The communication between Esther and Nora is complicated, and there is no intimacy between them. The novel starts with Nora meeting her mother and Aunt Lisa, her father's sister, 
in the train station when she comes back for the summer to visit. Several times, Esther asks Nora, how was the trip? But doesn't listen to her daughter's answer. The third time she asks Nora that question, Nora again tries to answer, but Esther cuts her in the middle of the sentence and says, oh, I forgot to tell you, it's impossible to spend the night at home tonight. It is being painted. You have no choice but to sleep over the Bergman's place. Bergman's, you'll hear about them a little bit later, and that's also where she had the nightmare for the first time. That's long-time friends of the family. <coughs> Esther is occupied with her own distress, <coughs> and there is no room for her daughter. The real reason Esther doesn't want Nora to return home is that Yaakov, Nora's father, has returned from the mental hospital, and Esther does not want Nora to be there with him. Nora notices that something is not right, because Esther avoids eye contact. But she doesn't dare to ask her mother for an explanation <coughs> in order to avoid confrontation, just like the beggar in the nightmare. It is, if the condominium is being painted, why then Aunt Lisa and Esther are able to spend the night there? The relationship between Nora and Esther contains manipulations and secrets. True, these attributes are not necessarily related to shame, but shame includes them. The lecture. So let me just uh, let me just <laughs> finish it in a few minutes. In a few minutes, okay. Um, I thought I can speak about thirty minutes. Okay. So um, so what happens is that. Uh, we see in the novel, in other places, how in a very subtle way, Nora criticizes her mother. She's unable to criticize her directly because of the shape. So, for example, she tells about um, an opera scene. They go to the opera with Karen, her love object, and he invites a few, a few of them. And, uh, Basically, Nora, indi very indirectly, um, talks about her mother in terms of talking about her as a peasant, like the mother of the interior minister who comes there with you know, all his glory, he brings his mother. Um, and in a different place in the novel, we we learn that her mother, Nora's mother, also comes from peasantry, and that Nora has a choice between wanting to identify with her father, who comes from cantors and rabbis, but also with, comes from mental illness that she dreads, or the peasantry of her mother, she prefers mental illness <laughs> over being like her mother. Um, and so on. I, I see it repeatedly also in her diaries. I see it also in other stories. And I promise not to mention poetry. Um, but it has a lot of it in it too. And so at the end of the novel, when um, Nora thinks that she sees the light, she actually doesn't, because she doesn't deal with the real issue of shame that came years before her father's illness. And that was also that Goldberg's problem. Um, she couldn't get over her depressions and her issues. 
um, and she had to tolerate her mother with her until the day she died. <laughs> um, so that's the lecture. <laughs>